picture is all I have. All I've ever wanted to give, Lord. The trees diminishing a tunnel and archway. There is a child, there is a man. Lord, I prefer the child smoothing over the cracked leaves, carrying home color on his shoes, bringing a prayer to you, two or three words. Small hands that are yours, Lord, black, indecipherable, magnificent things that are yours. Everywhere I turn, everywhere I turn is a detour from the soul, the soul, a detour from the south, self, soul, self, Lord. The rain falling there is slow and terrific. The boy you made, Lord, loves the rain, cool as cloth on the face, loves thinking of the leaves comforted, worthy then of being in their presence. The boy draws a diagram of when it opened, fast leaves, intersected lines, Lord, of course. He is a dot, he is a scent, compresses it, the way to you when he forgets it. See how he has drawn you as a crown, Lord, in purple. Because the gold is gone. He sits on it with affection so it will not squeak when he touches it. Soul pressure. A poem from Leonard Contaris, he looked beyond my faults and saw my deeds, which was published by Hanging Loose Press. Well, good evening again. Uh, my name is Charles Carr and welcome to Philly Loves Poetry, a collaborative initiative between the Philadelphia Moonstone Art Center and Philly Cam. The focus of our program is to give our viewers and our listeners, the experience of the rich culture of poetry in the city of Philadelphia, and also to introduce them to many of the poets, uh, which we have many poets in Philadelphia. So tonight um, we have a very special guest, someone uh, I would have to introduce before I say anything, that has probably done more to enhance the love of poetry in the city of Philadelphia than anybody that I know, and that is Leonard Guntarik. Leonard is the author of seven books of poems, including Look Beyond My Faults and Saw My Needs, and uh, also Take Your Hand Out of My Pocket, Shiva, and more recently, the Paris Poems of Jim Morrison, which was published by the Moonstone Press. Leonard's poems have appeared in Field, Poet Laureate, Verse Daily, Fence, Poetry Northwest, The American Poetry Review, Joyful Noise, an anthology of American spiritual poetry, and the best American poetry edited by Paul Muldoon. Leonard coordinates PeaceWorks, Poetry in Common, Philly Poetry Day, Leonard hosts the Green Line Reading and Interview Series and is poetry consultant for Whitman at 200, Art and Democracy. Leonard conducts the poetry workshop, Making Poems That Last, and his poem, 37 Photos from the Bridge, selected by Alice Quinn, was a poetry winner for the Big Bridges Motion Poem Project and the basis for the award-winning film sponsored by the Weissman Art Museum in Minneapolis. So welcome, Leonard. Welcome, Leonard, and uh, it's great to have you. Um, Hello, Charles, thanks for joining me. And uh, um, so I'm very much <laughs> looking forward to this. So the focus of our uh, interview tonight with Leonard is a focus on spiritual poetry and particularly uh, spiritual poetry 
uh, of Leonard Gontarik. So as an, an entry point, uh, Leonard, I wanted to quote a uh, review from a much beloved uh, local poet, A.V. Christie, in her review of uh, your book, He Looked Beyond My Faults and uh, Saw My Needs. And A.V. writes, these are markedly spiritual poems. So gospel words like grace and fallen and soul make a deep instinctive sense that become qualities, distillations. We feel in the book as a, a whole, the grace of being caught up in falling, how given all of our faults, one can still be seen and known beyond fault to the very vulnerable human interior. The need in many of these poems is both spiritual and candidly sexual in the great vein of mysteries and ecstasies. I see moon crested halo of the rest between your leg Leonard Gontarik has in his poem, Email. So that with a starter, uh, Leonard, uh, from 80s, I would really like to use that as a, a platform of entry into the world, the spiritual world of Leonard Gontarik and his poetry. All right. That sounds great. Uh, I'm coming through loud and clear. Yes, you are. Okay. Am I? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> yes, you are. So listen, if I can, what I wanted to do is I want to um, begin by saying a couple of quick things. One is uh, people have begun to ask me what makes the poem spiritual. So this will certainly be as defined by my poems and by me. Um, one of the things I'll say is the spiritual act is... Um, you're having noted to me that um, how much uh, soul pressure uh, has affected you and, um, you know, your reading of it uh, is, is uh, you know, a communal act and it is a spiritual act. It's the community from reader to poet. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is uh, someone uh, also noted that, uh, will this program do them any good because they're recovering Catholic. And um, I said that if you understand that I think one of the most beautiful spiritual songs ever written was Madonna's Like a Prayer, then, um, then we're pretty much thinking the same thing. So I wanna say something about those words, grace, and prayer, and soul, that um, there's a, there's a reason why I address them. They're addressed in poems, and uh, that's because there is a break. There is something that needs to be repaired. There is a dark night of the soul. Um, sometimes we have a little bit of it every day. So I want to begin by reading uh, in the spirit of things someone else's poem. Uh, it's a David Wagner poem called Lost. And it's a poem I've read many times, many times in, in classrooms. And um, it it is informed by Native American, the, the sacred of the Native American. So lost. Stand still, the trees ahead and bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are is called here and you must treat it as a powerful stranger must ask permission to know it, be known. The forest breathes, listen, it answers. I have made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again saying, here. No two trees are the same to raven. No two branches are the same to wren. If what a tree or a bush does is lost on you, you are surely lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. Mm. Okay, so, so that's um, David Wagner. I wanted to read a couple more here. This is uh, a poem called Adoration. Uh, that's a, 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 a spiritual term, a religious, uh, somewhat religious term. And uh, uh, there is a famous, uh, painting um, 
of uh, the Annunciation, which is uh, the Adoration. And um, this was, uh, uh, Charles came out of a conversation that I had with a poet about um, the word adore and, and its use as in common speech and as a poet. So um, it's, a, it's a three part poem, Ador adoration one. I adore poetry. Adore strikes me as an odd word, but right. I recognize the spiritual tone of the word. My poems are meditative, so it makes sense. Through poetry, what I know and what I do not know has been revealed. There is a rising above that is meaning. Is there something else in the mix? A formal dialogue between a convert and the sacred? Yes. Am I comforted to be good at art at times when I am not good at life? Yes, clearly. Poetry, mine or another's, makes me feel better than sex and cold beer on a hot summer night under a sky full of stars. And just to show you, I haven't taken leave of my senses. Sometimes poetry is a runner-up to that. Is this adoration? I think it is. Is it befitting? Even in its slang use, as in, I adore Johnny Depp or I adore these boots, I think it is. I also happen to think God is happy not to be adored by me. Part two, three poems, the last one by Robert Penn Warren. Eight summer. Apples, apples, I am someone else. 1978. Self-portrait with book. I am nostalgic for the present. Green rainfalls, I drink tea and dreams, 2008. Tell me a story. Long ago in Kentucky, I, a boy, stood by a dirt road in a stark, heard the great geese hoot northward. I could not see them, there being no moon and the stars sparse. I heard them. I did not know what was happening in my heart. It was the season before the elderberry blooms. Therefore, they were going north. The sound was passing north. And part three, adoration, a final note. In the great painting, The Annunciation by Fra Angelico or Leonardo da Vinci or Henry Ossola Tanner, an angel, God's messenger, and Mary's mother come to her to tell her, if I remember the story correctly, that she is pregnant with God's child and the conception did not involve sex. What was Mary's response? Let's put this in contemporary terms. Mary is a teenage girl. She is pregnant and she will start to show and then really start to show and her girlfriend, her school girlfriends, for instance, will start to ask questions. Who was it? Was it Joseph? No, it wasn't Joseph. Why do you say it was Joseph? Mary has told her answer. There is to be, it wasn't anyone. I'm still a virgin. What was Mary's response? I say her response was basically the equivalent of, yeah, right, I'm so sure. I'm going to tell people that. You got to love Mary. I adore her. I'll stop there for a minute, Charles. How's that? Oh, that's, yeah, yeah. And so the other, you know, you know, part of is this rendering, of, and um, there is one, you know, on the one hand, somewhat of a reverence, a, a sacredness, and the, and God is in the capital. G. So uh, in one sense, you say God fingers us all night long. And then there's another line, God is shaking out powder in secret compartment of the green, of the ring. God is a dream. So how do we understand this God of yours? Uh, 
Leonard, or do, do we really have to understand your God? What is your rendering of God? Well, I mean, simply put, throughout the books, I think I have, um, I've come to describe via poetry um, what that God is. One of, one of the things is the God is uh, sometimes spelled with a lowercase and sometimes with an uppercase. Uh, there's a particular poem where God um, is, uh, God is on the phone. It says, God is pacing. God is jealous. God has two cigarettes going at once. So it's a human. Um, it, it, it's a human God. It's, it's, um, it's a voice. It's, a, it's, um, one that I feel, in order to understand it, um, I, I, I believe God is more down to earth, but reverently. Um, I, uh, if I could, I'll just do uh, quickly a poem that um, speaks to um, that who who God is. I'll talk about first that the God in the poem is. Um, it's I, I try the map to God is through the soul. I'm not so much interested in what picture God would have, but the picture of the soul I'm very interested in. So in this case, um, I describe this the soul as um, something you do clandestinely. Uh, in this case, it's like as a young boy uh, sneaking a cigarette. Uh, they used to be. Um, you know, another a very politically charged, but um, they used to be acceptable and they used to be a, a, a kind of a, a lore about them, um, maybe even a kind of evil, evil mm -hmm. about them. So, this is a poem called 8 a.m. The Saul smokes in secret, the Saul hates his enemies, and those he loves. So I'm hoping that that um, describes to you um, the, the, the soul there means that it's a, you're alone when you're doing this act and you're alone with your soul, the soul. It's a good place to be private with the soul and understand it. And the understanding there is that, um, you know, at times um, the, the soul accepts that, we love and we hate. We have people who love us and we have enemies. And that um, you, in a way you you love them equally. That, that to me is a, a version of God. If I could, uh, one more, I wanted to, um, I know that you, uh, you wanted to talk a little bit about, um, and A.B. Christie did the sensual in the poems having to do with um, God. And uh, the poem that follows the one I just read in the book, uh, <clears throat> Take Your Hand Out of My Pocket, Shiva says, it's called I Know. And uh, you were asking about, can you blend the, uh, can you blend prayer, a plea with intimacy, so. I know, I know it will be winter soon. The dark blooms and glazed landscape and zero weather, but it is summer. You spread your legs and my glass is steam. So also in a uh, place in your poem, uh, there is a citation about being and nothingness, which is uh, uh, the, the use the word that turning the pages for eternity. So, how does Sartre uh, fit into this, you know, this paradigm, this this view that you have of 
the spiritual. Um, that's a great question. So, um, uh, actually, uh, segueing from the poem, take your hand out of my pocket, Shiva. Shiva is the Hindu god with uh, many, many arms. And um, in that poem you're quoting, uh, I say, um, I'm uh, doing, I'm reading, a, holding a book with one hand, I'm stirring my cereal with another, and uh, with my third hand, I can't recall it all, but I'm eating an orange. So I have three hands. And um, I say, uh, I, I, turning, the book is turning the pages of being in nothingness for eternity. So, so to me, uh, you know, Paul Stevens uses the word priest an awful lot in his poems. I, I, I don't think I'm a priest. I don't. I, I don't at all, but I think that there's some reverence and there's something we hold sacred as poets. So what I'm um, getting to is that what I loved about Sartre is that uh, I know he, he wrote books on his philosophy, but he was able to write novels like in which that was a description of the soul and, and ways I thought it was even a description perhaps of God as he saw God. And so he was important to me because he showed me that as a poet, uh, you know, poems are like prayers. Uh, and maybe not words that would exactly be Sartre's mouth, but that's that's how I see it. The, the others, um, other, uh, Poets uh, and writers that have had an effect are uh, one is um, uh, Emil Shorin, um, who he writes quasi essays on the spiritual, on, on everything. But one of the things, his connection to God is he uses a phrase, he says to God, um, enlighten me or rehabilitate me like a very intrepid thing to say to God, but it's, to me, it's straightforward. It's, it's the language of poets. And so I think we're in the vicinity of the spiritual as poets. So I uh, hope that, um, you know, answers your question. So in this state of this, I, um, go ahead. Go ahead. So in this state of, uh, you know, our, our fallen state, our brokenness. Do you feel that, you know, that um, this is what existence, like for some people that are spiritual, is that we're trying to rectify our existence somehow in um, kind of in a score, spiritual scoreboard uh, so that there, there is a, you know, a place for us in the, in the afterlife, um, how much do you how much do you see that? How much does your poetry, uh, you know, recognize this? Charles, you know, I'm so when you're a poet, you kind of have two jobs, you're holding two jobs at once. And I don't think I'm uh, preparing for the afterlife. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm kind of busy. I'm kind of busy attain, trying to attain the, uh, the search for the miraculous here. But mm -hmm. I suppose it will, uh, it should come, you know, um, come naturally enough, but um, I know what you're asking, and that brokenness is um, what I um, refer to as um, it, it, what we have in common. What what um, it, why we come to poetry, uh, why we people come to prayer, why they turn to God. It's um, it, 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 they, they they're they're asking, um, they're asking for help. And um, 
So I feel like if I ask all the right questions and put it in the right order of words here, I'll be okay. I'm also very influenced by a comment a poet made where someone asked uh, the afterlife of his poems. And um, I think it's a, poets are very literal and they're very pragmatic. So when he was asked, do you, do you want people to be reading your poems after you're dead? And he basically said, well, if I had a choice, I'd like to be alive after I'm dead. <laughs> and I, I think that's a... That's a perfectly great answer. So, well, I do have a, a poem, Charles, yeah. called "Falling," that mm -hmm. um, that I wanted to, wanted to go ahead and read. Sure. Okay. Floor is yours. And um, it, it's a, it's a it's a kind of uh, okay. It's uh, falling. Uh, this is like rock bottom. The poet's the poem's father is a drunk. The poem's mother becomes cold hearted. The poem reads as a translation. It begins the first of many affairs. Snow is falling off the roof. The crows are beautiful. Serrate the dark, which is beautiful, with their flight just after dusk. I'm empty too, you know. I'm nothing but a horror of dust. And then I just, one more, and we could talk some more. This is uh, from the same book. This is from He Looked Beyond My Faults. And this is Incoming Prayer. So it's a, you know, it's a rather um, cavalier adjective for um, uh, uh, the modified prayer with uh, incoming prayer. I told the woman in the garden, autumn is without birds, as if she didn't know. The leaves, the Persian carpet. She kissed me during the war. During the war, she said, we hid under everything. We hid under each other. Sometimes nothing happened. The planes kept going, transporting a strange, a strange cargo, bodies packed in ice and oranges. Mm. Again, I think that's uh, trying to combine the, the, you know, the sacred and perhaps the profane, yeah, or the sensual. So, I think it would be really good rather yeah, than not, <laughs> continually, you know, like uh, it's best to understand your the spiritual element of your poems is to hear more of these poems and the ones that you select that are probably the best manifestation of this spiritual element uh you know in, in your poetry um there's just one thing i wanted to you know before we do that is that in the, your poem philosophical models uh wallace stevens appears and um it's just a very interesting ending to me that you know about uh you mentioned in, in the fourth paragraph of it, abruptly announced the reading over. I guess I'll be taking off now. His words taking off, making sounds like a motor starting and engaging, spreading out his arms, running down the aisle. So Wallace Stevens, uh, there, there is another uh, person that I know you uh, whose poetry I know you admire very much. Um, yeah, and I, I would say in terms of the spiritual, uh, both of you are, to me, very much similar. Would you say that? Um, sure, absolutely. I mean, and uh, something about the model of a poet um that you, you learn the template to form a poem and um a, a great deal i learned you know from him and um that poem in particular that you mentioned that you mentioned uh, again i i choose him as a godlike figure but i i try to 
not irreverently, but try to bring them down to size. And I'll say, note the the, the spiritual image at the end of it's tongue in cheek, but um, he is he is like an angel spreading out his arms and leaving, and um, mm -hmm. two. And uh, I wanted to. I wanted to say that, um, so what do I get from Wallace Stevens? Well, um, there's, a, there's a poem um, where, where I discuss in an earlier book, uh, Angels. Um, I noticed a lot of people were writing about angels, and I wasn't, and so I thought maybe I should explore this. But one of the things that I said about angels is no matter... Um, when an angel flies and lands, it always land. It'll always land on its knees, which is pretty much how I feel like um, what I'm saying about falling. Um, before we get up, we're on our knees, and that there is some, um, you know, it's a, it's an acceptance, and it's, a, mm -hmm. it's a, um, there is a, there is something that transcends. I want to say too, Charles, since you mentioned um, Wallace Stevens, um, like I've turned to, he has a poem called um, The Final Soliloquy of the Interior mm. Paramore. I want to read just the last stanza, yeah. which um, gives a good idea what, what I consider spiritual and poetry. And he says, how high that highest candle lights the dark. Out of this same light, out of the central mind, we make a dwelling in the evening air in which being there together is enough. So he doesn't have enormous, it's, it's a wonderful thing because he's not setting up enormous expectations. He's saying just that we, we're, we're there with each other. And that's an impressive thing said in some very remarkable poetry. So, um, so you, you want me, you like me to read for a little while? Is that what I yeah, uh, and the other thing you can is, and I'll get started if you want to ask some. No, this is just okay. a, just my, I would say, my final observation since I've read so much of your poetry is that the spiritual in nature, uh, you know, the authentic spiritual uh, in nature, um, the unexplainable uh, beauty uh, of nature, and, you know, the hand or whatever behind, um, behind that. But uh, your poems do deal a lot with, with that, but in a very spiritual way. True. Well, that's well, it's wonderful to hear. I appreciate that. I mean, I I think that that's why I have a idea that poetry is in common, that we have it in common. Anyone uh, standing before a sunrise or a sunset is having a spiritual experience. Um, you know, we just try to find the words for it. But, the experience is still her. And that's why you'll find the natural world often in my poems, I think. Right. Let's hear so, some more um, I, I wanted to, okay, I wanted to just uh, uh, ask God to just step back for a minute. I, I want to say just I'll read a couple poems um, that I've written on the subject of Zen, and um, it, it, so Zen is of great interest to me. I I rarely use m much of the language of Zen Buddhism in poems. So other poets tend to use a lot of it, uh, but I do know that I like the idea of the Zen parable. And I think it's part of the model of my poem. So I wanted to, um, for example, so this is called Knowledge and Happiness. Hairs of red light swirl in the darkness. 
Baskets of fresh cut grass float four stories up. Four humans are waiting for the bus. One of them will write about their life but does not know it now. A, a woman carries violets snapped from their stems. Her pants are wet and flecked with dark wet grass. A sparrow falls and catches itself, a feeling we know all too well. The stars clank like shells in a bucket. Moonlight spills warm across everything near to us. I stand outside this master's door again. I hesitate. I know nothing. I know I know nothing. He will ask me. All I want to whisper is, I am hungry. Eat me. Hmm. Better could and, you move just back a okay. little bit from the screen so that we can see a more full face? Sure. Okay. Uh, so this, uh, how's that? A little more. There so we go. So this poem Perfect. is a poem. Perfect. It's called, okay. This poem is called Zen for Beginners. It's the title of this book. Um, it has a charming illustration on it that it kind of looks like the scene from uh, a scene from Waiting for Godot, but it has uh, a man sitting there uh, with a kite, but it's on the end of a fishing line. And there it is. So this is the title poem from it. And um, I, I'll read it and then I'll... Um, I wanted to make a comment about it, but Zen for Beginners. I moved to the back of the street toward the white birds and water as in dream. Interesting trees rustling. I follow the hum of the outboard motor and return. I follow the barge carrying everything that is not the barge away and return as in a dream. I like this street. I like this town, pigeons, silver and flicker blue. I enter a shop, guns and philosophy, buying a rifle and bullets. Will that be cash for charge? Stacking a shell into the cylinder, I pointed at the clerk. Charge, if you know what I mean. The ache in my heart begins. So I'm hoping that that uh, reads as a kind of a Zen parable. And, and, and Zen parables can be, um, they can be a little, uh, a bit of tough love. I wanted to um, say something about that poem, which is, um, you know, real life does intervene with uh, the life of the poet and the life of the poem. But, um, so when that book was published, I had a reading in, in a bookstore that I own uh, with my wife. And um, the night before, this young man came in and uh, he was asking me a lot of questions about the book. He was asking me about the poem in particular. And um, so that was a Friday night. And the next morning when I opened the store at 9 a.m., um, he came right into the store and uh, no kidding, he put a gun to my back and he held me up. Oh. So it's the strangest uh, discussion and reaction I've had to my poem um, so far. Well, he took Sin for Beginners in a very different way, I guess, right? He sure did. So um, if I just to move a little bit more, I wanted to, um, I, I know, um, you know, you're very fond of the, um, the Paris poems of Jim Martin, which is a very new book uh, yes. of mine, um, published by Moonstone. And, um, I, I want to read a poem that you asked me to read, um, and, you know, we, I, I want to read a couple, but I'll read that one first. Um, let me just find it. 
And these poems are untitled. Um, so this is uh, number 27. Morning clears like smoke after a battle. Curves of graves and streets, red birds, red flowers, occasional accident. Spirit lies in the branches. A butterfly explodes. What is behind things will wait behind things. There are too many mirrors in these rooms, too many on the ceilings. I drop a spoon of scotch in this coffee, floating like film on river, dip the bread in. Fog rises like Christ in the park. The uniform army of sweepers, moving the ordinary and supernatural. Spirit lies in the key of the nightstand near a pitcher of water. Spirit is a family with flowers making small talk marching through the cemetery. What is revealed is revealed. What is hidden remains. Small, cold, blue flames. Oh, I love that. I love that what I really do. And, you know, I, I, I mentioned that to you, really, that as I read uh, the Paris poems, and I said to you, and not only in that particular piece, but throughout the book, I saw so much uh, spiritual, maybe even more than in that book and that those poems uh, than in other. But perhaps that's just me. I'm not saying you, this was like a, uh, you know, your slant on it, but this sense of, uh, of searching, this sense of, uh, once again, uh, a certain uh, feeling of uh, brokenness, uh, but the search and the way that you have, uh, the way you uh, have revealed it in these poems is uh, really, uh, A, it's enjoyable, it, you know, uh, poetry, but it does, it does, uh, it really did hit me as very spiritual. And I don't think maybe people would, would uh, put Jim Morrison together with uh, spirituality, maybe other people would. Um, so, you know, that was my, that's my take on it. And I guess everybody, it's, a, you know, poetry is a phenomenon and everybody feels it in, in so many different ways. You mentioned the aspect in the poems of his um, walking around Paris or the environs. And um, I mean, I want to say for your audience, uh, Jim Morrison moved to Paris, left America, left his band, The Doors. He wrote some poetry, but he did not write a lot in the last months of his life. These are poems that I imagine. Um, so in that, one of the things in down earth terms, I, th I think of um, when we think of, uh, so I'm using a persona here, and that a persona is like a voice. Uh, poets use a persona often in poems, and um, it's it's a legitimate, um, you know, device of a poem. But in this in this case, it's like. Uh, it's the vo his voice coming in, you know, it's, we're taking my voice. And uh, that's kind of like, a, if I can use it in the lowercase, the voice of God. And it's a, it's understanding of, of soul by, by viewing uh, an aerial view of his soul. And uh, so, so you might mm -hmm. see all that um, sacredness in it. I want to, if I could, read a couple more from the book, um, which sure um, cover absolutely. Uh, cover a bit what you're um, talking about. This one is uh, poem twenty two. The men on the roof slathering it with glue, tipping the slate into place. The tapping extended to the ends of the city, filling the silence and the night. They have no bones, and it rains slowly in their souls. The men behind glass, you cannot see them. 
the sun hits the you know, like gold water. They have their shoes off, signing papers, approving assassinations, executions, their silver pens. They have no bones, and it rains slowly in their souls. I make movies, war stories, interspersed with eroticism, angels in negligees, descending on battlefields, administering oral sex to the wounded. I have no bones, and it rains in my soul. And I've one more that I think uh, is a good one to follow that. And this is poem 25. I am the wise man. I am the fatted cat. I am watching rain flicker like fish in a gold river. I am the neon kiss. A woman lays her head in my lap and sleeps. You want to know what is in my soul, empty sky, rich, unraveling scent of autumn. I want my soul to fall, reheated coffee, licking cinnamon from your hands. I am stained glass. I am the wise man. I am the woman. She begins to snore softly. My legs vibrate. View of rooftops. Terracotta dusk. Leaves rattling in a raffle wheel. Ordinary gods in the fountain. Women's, women's hair I comb. Gummy, leaf-scented fingers. Cake dust on the floor. I work the soul. Wow. Leonard, um, kind of deviating from this, but really not. Mm -hmm. Can you, like, share with us just the process of creating, you know, uh, a book like this? uh you know poems like that in terms of time and um kind of the way you had to really structure this and organize it and how do you keep that momentum because when one reads the book there is a definite momentum that it all fits together quite well uh as a poem as opposed to some books of poems that you really you almost just say well he wrote that last week, or he wrote, wrote that last month, and there's really a momentum here in the, as you read this 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 piece, and I've read it twice about that. And so, could you share that with 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 our with us? Well, one of the first things, Charles, is um, Jim Morrison is a. a important figure for me, um, was an important figure growing up. Um, it, it, I had this idea of a poet built a little bit around him, um, you know, the rock part of him. But it, you know, he would just stop where he was apparently and just start chanting poetry. And, you know, as a young man, I tried that once in a while. It helped if you were at a party and you stood on a table, but um, it really was the, an experience of, of poet. And uh, it was uh, undefined at the time, but it, it was one experience. The other thing is, uh, you know, I, I know there are persona poems and I know um, I don't do them a lot, but one of the things is that you really have to have a subject that you're not researching, that you're just, you you're just dying to read more about the subject, you know, like, and I've listened to his music over and over and over again, not because I was writing poems, but because I listened to his music. So that makes a difference. And maybe in, uh, you know, the, the concentration, the, the passion, the, you know, how, how the poems seem um, driven. Um, the other thing is, and it's not always the case, Charles, but, I, I started writing these poems um, about 20 years ago. Wow. And uh, I've returned to them time and again. And I've, I've worked on, worked, you know, what have had a, have had at them a lot. And um, so it, it took a while to get to, to this point. But um, 
I, I mean, I hope that answered your your answer to the question. Yeah, I do think well, it does. That's to me. Yeah. I was. I, okay. There's such a, an energy. I mean, that just be, from begin that begins and the way it the you know the book of poems and you know of course they are number, but the way the book proceeds, there's such an energy. You know, in, in, in this, uh, it does give the feeling like that. This was a, this was really something that was uh, more compact in terms of time. So when you said, you know, I started to, started this many years ago, there isn't that feel to it. You know, um, so I mean, that's just a, as I said, we perceive things differently, and you know, but there's a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, in in that book and in the, in the movement, uh, as one reads as one reads through it. So I mean, I'm talking too much. We I don't want to hear more of your poems. <laughs> okay, um, so I want to uh, read this uh, poem, which um, it's about an event, and um, it. it um, you know, from and and it, it was a couple, a family leaving a vacation and a couple cars, and one of the cars was in an accident. I was very young, um, but I I realized that there's a um, you know there's a tone of the distance from the event and the event being uh, it was miraculous and that no one was hurt. Um, fortunately, uh, but it, it was frightening and it was in the rain, it's at night. And uh, this is the poem that I wrote um, in two parts Gleamed. They fish the sky, the rocks gleam, rocks disappeared. Clearly, they saw this. They continued drying hands after they were dry. We all do this in one way or another, we always do this. They thought footprints made sense to a point, fingerprints less so. They planted in fall, they planted in spring, they planted in summer. They bumbled their souls in layers of clothes. They brought jars of ants unless they forgot them. They brought gold chicken, they brought sherbet. You got to love them for that. They were alone small stacks of firewood. Two, it wasn't like a dream. The lights moved and said, rain continued to fall. No, no one was hurt. How you define hurt depends on much. The egg of the world we carried broke. The day was now in another summer. Those we knew in that car were safe. The fireflies above the lawn had begun to sink. Could we have known? We would have stayed home always. The soul broken in four equal parts. So we have about uh, maybe five, six uh, minutes uh, remaining. So we still have time for more poems. Okay. And I'll do that. I, I have a, a, a couple here I'd like to read to end. I wanted to, um, so that since that was another poem about the um, broken soul, in fairness, I wanted to, in the, in the book, um, Take Your Hands Out of My Pocket, Shiva, um, there are, um, there are a couple of poems that, um, here's the poem that's called um, Philadelphia. And um, it's called, I'm sorry, it's called Philadelphia Caveat. And let me just get it, Charles, because this is um, like, would be my uh, definition of what a um, prayer is. So. And this book, I'll mention again, this has has a bunch of poems uh, that I think are of the spiritual nature. So here's Philadelphia, Caveat. 
Prayer is dark coffee, little milk, lots of sugar. It occurs at evening, which is now. And then the final uh, poem in the book is called Prayer. Prayer, slate gray clouds gather to the gold pond in morning. Shall I pray for spring? Roost their heads of flowers, pecking their way above ground. You are number five in the queue. So just essentially, I want to say, um, you are number five in the queue means uh, that's our sense of prayer. Um, it's like calling, uh, calling some number for help and being told, um, you know, you have a five, ten minute wait or you have a six caller. Mm -hmm. Seems like an important time in silence to wait, that being fifth in the queue. So here's a, um, here's a poem uh, which is uh, called About the Great Trees. And uh, this is a newer poem. It's from a book that will be published this fall of mine called The Long Way Home. I write about the great trees, that is the sea of leaves, a coming darkness rising past the windows. I understand, I may not understand. Not everyone does. I accept it. Like a train without an open seat moving past windows, moving past mountains coated with purple talc. That's part mysterious for the most part can be explained. The wind, it is true, in the trees is a beautiful noise, like your lover behind you afterward, telling you the most inconsequential, absorbing things. She is close to your ear and you is closer. I came here for peace, even though it may not come. A child calls out in the quiet. The stillness has something of the silver of the clouds. I like to think the child is myself, of course, a long time ago. I had a pure open heart then. People walking on the street crushed the leaves. I wept. That poem, um, I'm going to keep reading, but that poem I think really speaks to the salt pressure poem with that young man and that yeah. poem. Yeah. It was written yeah. quite a time after it. Yeah. So here's a, 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 a small poem that we're good on time still, Charles? Yeah, we have, a, you're really coming up against it. We have, probably have about a minute left, but I think you can get it in. Okay. Uh, um, all right. So I'm going to, I'm going to end uh, with this uh, uh, poem. It's, um, it's a call, poem called Prayer 2, and um, I just thought it, would, it seemed like a good poem to end with. Um, Prayer 2. Lord, the tree is not so, can know the tree. Shadow tree covers rustling and ejection of leaves. I can hold the leaves. In another's dream, I move to the next tree. The land of white and blind from the light. I can hold the name of the tree. I know your name, word lying in the throat. I can kiss your wife in that. I can read the history of the self in the tree. Slow down in the middle. Pass over description. Get lost in flickering and wind and ether in between. I can hold the half. Neither the tree nor the history nor meaning nor photographic memory. The hallucination is eerie of tree on this all hollows eve. The creek means little beside uh, the leaves center. The hand floats in the white water utterly. Wow. So thanks a million, Charles. And oh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, really, this has really been a, a treat uh, for our audience and uh, uh, I'm, I will continue to promote uh, 
Poetry Month this month and some of the unique things that we can do uh, for poetries. But once again, Leonard, thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed this uh, interview and your poems, as I always do very much. See you next time. Thank you.